One evening, late in April of 1850, the Aisling family's world got turned upside down. Not just a little bit tilted, mind you, but wholly, truly, and topsy-turvily tangled and tumbled into something that sensible folk wouldn't believe for a second. Cassandra Aisling, who was nine years and eleven months, which made her very, very close to ten, didn't care a jot what sensible people thought. Cassandra liked strange, mysterious, and magical things, none of which you were likely to find by being sensible. Cassandra's father, Professor Algernon Aisling, taught at a university lecturing on mythology and ancient legends. Mythology and legends, as you may have heard, are absolutely full of strange, mysterious, and magical things. So this made Professor Aisling a quite perfect father for Cassandra. There were people who said that the professor wasn't quite sensible, but Cassandra didn't care a jot about that either. She liked his stories, and that was that. But in recent months, there had been few stories. Not quite a year past, Miss Lily Aisling had been taken from them by a fever, and they all still missed her greatly. Of late, however, Cassandra had seen that her father's brow was even more furrowed. In the evening when he returned home, Cassandra knew that something at the university troubled him. Cassandra's sister Miranda hadn't been much company either. Perhaps it was losing her mother, or turning 16, which is likely to make anyone think she should be sensible just in case someone is watching. But Miranda had suddenly decided to be all the way grown up at once. Anyone who has ever tried this can tell you that it is a great deal of work. Cassandra thought it to be very dull. But time passes, and the Aislings had once again begun to go walking along the River Thames, as they had always done. On that evening in April, Miranda and Cassandra got out their bonnets, as usual, and Cassandra called upstairs to their father to come down. She knew that he was at his desk, writing worrisome thoughts in his journal. Cassandra didn't mention this to her elder sister. When you are nine and eleven months old, a great many people are likely to think that you still belong in the cradle, especially older sisters. And, it so happens, young ladies named Cassandra have been having a difficult time being listened to for ages. What Cassandra didn't know was that on that very day, a quite horrid little man by the name of Bigawillow had told the professor that mythology was silly and that the university would soon be done with such nonsense. You can imagine how that made Professor Aisling feel. What would the world be like without all those magical old stories? When he at last left his desk, Cassandra pulled at his sleeve. Daddy, we've been waiting for hours. Please, let's hurry. I want to see the first star come out. Her father tweaked a lock of her hair. Lucky thing we didn't name you patience, he said. She giggled and swung the door wide, and then jumped down the front steps two at a time. Miranda gave her father a shy smile and followed her younger sister. As they walked toward London's river, the professor asked himself, Are the old stories no longer of use? And then he answered himself immediately, Of course they are, he said aloud, which made Miranda glance at him and wish he'd be sensible and not talk to himself. Imagination is where science begins, the professor explained, thumping his stick, not with charts and tools and measurements, first the idea, then the experiment, and he thumped his stick down again. Father, whispered Miranda, please stop talking to yourself. People will look at us. Eh, what? asked her father, looking around just in time to miss stepping in a puddle. Then he sighed. I wish I'd thought to say all that to Bigawill all this morning. You wish you had said what, Daddy? asked Cassandra, slipping her hand into his. One's imagination is where science starts, because you have to have the idea first, and that the old myths are one of the ways to keep your imagination working. Cassandra didn't quite know what he was talking about, but she did like the myths, because they were stories. And they were magic. Will you tell me a story tonight? she asked. Which one would you like? Something with fairies and magic, she said, and then added, and perhaps a dragon, which reminded the professor of what Bigawillow had said after he had called mythology nonsense. Too bad you chaps can't find a dragon or a dryad, Big Willow had snorted, amused at his own wit, because it would take such an astounding miracle to save your department. Remembering this, the professor began to mutter again. For a few moments he allowed himself to daydream about a ship that could take him to the land of legends. Well, that kind of daydreaming sometimes results in the most surprising things. 
and this time that something was pure magic. Hearing him talking to himself, Miranda again sighed. Cassandra, bored with how slowly they had walked, jumped over the puddle and ran on ahead. So it was she who first saw the odd little ship moored alongside an old abandoned dock. There was something very strange and mysterious about the ship, and Cassandra thought immediately of magic. She called back to her father and sister, but they paid no attention. Finally, the professor and Miranda walked to her side, and Cassandra, although she knew pointing wasn't polite, pointed at the ship and began asking questions. Her father and sister could see that here was something quite extraordinary indeed. The ship was small, delicate, and seemingly decorated just for beauty, rather than for a particular function. More surprising still, the crew members moving around the deck and rigging were barely more than three feet tall. Cassandra knew, because of all the stories her father had told her, that these were dwarves. Flashing here, there, however sometimes nearly upsetting the dwarves, were even smaller creatures, dressed in absurdly tall stovepipe hats, bright red jackets, and spats. Cassandra pulled at her father's sleeve. Daddy, who are they? Perplexed, the professor shook his head. He too recognized dwarves, but even though he knew what they were, he had never actually expected to see one, much less a ship full of them. Miranda turned to see if other passerbys were looking, but they were all alone. I think we should go home, she said nervously. Suddenly, one of the dwarves walked briskly to where they stood. With a short bow, he introduced himself as Malachi, captain of the HMS Bassett. Then, this strange personage said that something that Professor Aisling never would forget in his life. Your ship, Professor Aisling, is ready, and at your bidding. My ship? asked the professor. Aye, sir, and the tides of inspiration are with us, so you are right on time. Shall we board? The professor was completely flummoxed, which means to be confused and surprised all at once. When one has wished for a ship, and then had the wish immediately granted, one is sure to be completely, and perhaps absolutely, flummoxed. I can't believe this, the professor said, and the wonderment showed on his face. But sir, Captain Malachi answered, seriously, we're here precisely because you can believe. Professor Aisling stared in amazement. He looked at the ship, then back at Miranda and Cassandra. My daughters, he said. They're so young. They should be in school learning geometry, history, geography. They should... Is that more important than the geography of imagination? Captain Malachi broke in. Or the geometry of inspiration? You are all part of the adventure. It was as strange as anything the professor had ever heard and as ridiculous, and as impossible to refuse. He felt truly light-hearted for the first time in many months. Girls! he laughed gaily. Let's have an adventure! Cassandra needed no urging. She cried, yes! and fairly danced up the gangway. Miranda stood unmoving, a worried look on her face. This isn't even my best dress, she said. And, and how long will we be gone? professor hadn't an answer, but Captain Malachi scratched his chin and replied, If I'm not mistaken, all of yesterday and most of the day before. The professor couldn't help but laugh merrily. Never mind, answered her father, patting Miranda's cheek. I'll need you to help me keep an eye on Cassandra. Miranda hung back a moment longer. Then, with a sigh, she took her father's arm. They walked up the gangway and onto the magical little ship. Welcome aboard the Bassett, Professor. Ladies, Captain Malachi said with a neat, formal bow. Here's First Mate Sebastian. He'll show you to your quarters and give you a tour of the ship, while the crew and I get us underway. With another nod of his head, he turned and began calling orders. Bosun Eli, weigh the anchor. Helmsman Archimedes, hard a lie. Seaman Augustus, raise the banner. As the Aislings watched, a beautiful, turquoise blue embroidered silk banner lifted into the growing breeze. On it were the words, Crescendo Vides, Crescendo Vides, the professor said, hardly able to believe what he had read. By believing one sees? What nonsense, said Miranda. Daddy, asked Cassandra, isn't it supposed to be seeing is believing? Well, began the professor, it all depends, miss, on how you look at it. 
answered Sebastian. There began, around them, a sudden flurry of activity. The basset, which had seemed somewhat strange from a distance, was even stranger now that they were aboard. The dwarves went about their business, but the little people darted to and fro, in and out of the rigging. "'Excuse me, Mr. Sebastian, but what are those little people with the big hats and big feet?' asked Cassandra. Miranda and the professor each considered shushing her, but were equally curious. "'The little people are gremlins, miss.' "'Are they trying to help?' she asked. "'Yes, miss. Sometimes they find a short way or a better way to do something, and other times we spend an hour or two sorting out the mess. But among our folk there is an old saying, "'Use a dwarf to set a wunderlob and a gremlin to spin its wheel. So we need them, though often enough it's like needing a headache. "'What's a winter lube? Cassandra demanded. "'No,' he corrected. "'It's wunderlob. Or, if you're very, very proper, Wunderlob. Well, what is it? she asked. A Wunderlob is a device that we use to find the way out of the sensible world and navigate within the landscape of imagination. Come this way, and we can watch it work. As they sailed towards the open ocean, Captain Malachi gave the order for the helmsman Archimedes and a fidgety gremlin to work the Wunderlob. Archimedes took the sensible position, set the gears, and stood back, the gremlin, whose top hat was pulled so far down they could not see his eyes, grinned as he climbed onto a stool. He put his sticky little forefinger into a depression in the silver and copper wheel, and with complete abandon, whirled it howsoever it would go. The wheel began to twirl, and the dials whirled. Dials pointed up, down, and every which way. Bells dinged and tinkled from within, and the entire Wunderlob plunked, jingled, and sparkled. It vibrated and whirred, then with a loud ping and two thocks and a click, it pointed authoritatively with the grandest and most bejeweled arrow that way. What nonsense, Miranda said, for the deep blue water just looked the same. Of course, said Sebastian, you'll never find magic by being sensible. Shall we go below? Cassandra was the first to go. As she drew beneath the deck, down to where she could see the space below, she gasped, Good gracious! And her head popped back above the deck. Then she ducked down again. Laughing delightedly, she clattered down the steps and called back over her shoulder, Come along! It's so lovely! The professor followed, doing much the same, though as he stooped to look below for the second time, his face was full of wonder. He looked at Miranda and Sebastian, and said in amazement, It doesn't fit! Then he too disappeared from sight. Miranda descended slowly, worrying that they were playing some sort of jest. She stepped down and down until she could see her father and sister walking in a great hall. She too popped back up to look again at the small deck of the Basset. Then she stepped down for another look at the grand but surely impossible room below. Looking back at Sebastian, as though this were somehow his fault, she pointed out, That cannot possibly be there. It doesn't work. The room is simply too large to be inside this tiny ship, cried Miranda. The normally serious Sebastian gave a tiny smile, and his eyes twinkled. As you said, Miss Miranda, it's all nonsense. Sebastian, still smiling, politely led Miranda to her cabin. It was a pretty little room, but its beauty was lost on Miranda. She soon scurried back above. Her father and sister were happily exploring the strange space below, but Miranda didn't like it. The whole thing was absurd. There had to be some other and more reasonable explanation. She walked towards the bow of the ship, while a soft breeze cooled her face. Suddenly, looking up at the sails, billowing forward, she realized that the wind was coming from the wrong direction. The banner, with its n ridiculous motto, flew with the wind, in the opposite direction of the sails. It seemed to her that the strange little ship was merely pretending to do what a ship should do. Doesn't anything here work the way it's supposed to? She muttered unhappily, and not for the last time.